Welcome guys, Pastor Thad here, and uh, so glad to be hanging out with you and sharing God's Word. Um, so we've been in this This Is Us series, right, and looking in Romans chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles with you, your phone, tablet, turn over or click over to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, we're going to be looking at a pretty famous grouping of verses here. It's going to be verses 28 uh, through 30, verses 28 through 30. That's Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. So in this series, we've seen some incredible things. We've talked about how God doesn't condemn us. We've talked about how uh, our heart of gratitude leads us to do uh, works for his glory. And then this last week, we talked about a subject that we can't sweep under the rug. But we're talking about this is us. And we're talking about real life, this life that we experience. And so last week, we really started talking about um, suffering. And we looked at suffering through the apologetic of eternity. And so today we're going to kind of keep on with that conversation and, and keep talking about it in light of God's sovereignty, in light of God's sovereignty. And so I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the illustrations that I went through last week to talk about uh, suffering, although I think those are real and needful, but we covered those last week. And so uh, what I want to do now is I want to just kind of jump into this conversation about God's sovereignty, maybe define it qualify it a little bit because uh, sovereignty is, it's kind of a big word, right? So a definition of sovereignty that, that we can use for at least our discussion today is um, the, sovereignty in God, the sovereignty of God is the biblical teaching that all things are under God's direction or permission. That all things, everything that happens is either under God's direction, right? He wills it, he's volitional, he causes those things to happen, or uh, he allows it. God gives it permission to happen. Perhaps he doesn't stop it. So, for example, we know God doesn't do evil, but perhaps he wouldn't put his sovereign hands on, on, on something and evil happens, right? So we just want to kind of make that distinction that um, the sovereignty of God is the biblical teaching that all things are under God's direction or permission, okay, because there's some differences there. Now, let me say this about sovereignty. And I love the way uh, Matt Chandler said this when we're not able to explain all things, right? God's, uh, Matt Chandler says that God is a proclaimer, not an explainer. God is a proclaimer. He is sovereign, but not an explainer. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't in the Bible explain to us uh, what it means necessarily or, or how he is sovereign and everything. He just tells us that he is Sovereign. In fact, I, you know, I'm willing to bet if God tried to explain to us how He was sovereign in all things, either through His um, direct uh, direction or guidance in it, or in His permission, we we couldn't follow Him in that explanation. So Matt Chandler is right. God is a proclaimer and not an explainer. And let me also say this: you know, um, I can believe in sovereignty even though I don't understand it. Um, for example, I drive an automobile. And inside that automobile, there is a combustion engine. I don't know the first thing about combustion engines, but I know they get me from point A to point B. You see, I don't have to be able to explain everything to believe it and to believe that it works. And I believe that God works in his sovereignty. There's a quote that I like. It says this, In the tapestry of history, God weaves all threads into beauty when gazed at through the lens of eternity. I'll say it again. In the tapestry of history, God weaves all threads into beauty when gazed at through the lens of eternity. God does things in his sovereignty that we don't always understand. And, and there's so many illustrations we can give here, but I'll, I'll use this one. The death of Jesus. You know, when you think about this and uh, you think about God's son, you think about God being with us and, and how he is going to save us and, and, and how he is going to lead us. You know, if you're thinking about a story of God coming to earth, you'd think, oh, you know, he's going to come and he's going to be a wise teacher and he's going to be generous and he's going to be all these things and giving and compassionate and empathetic and all of these things. Um, but you would have never guessed that he was going to die on the cross. You would, have, you would have never just guessed that. That would have been a part of your story. In fact, I'm sure that Satan and all his minions were having a party, right? You know, God's son is dead. Um, Messiah is dead. We've won. But yet we understand that God worked this into something beautiful, something so ugly, that torture, that death. He worked it in something beautiful as Jesus became our substitutionary atonement. He took our sins in something so ugly that we wouldn't have known. And uh, Peter even talks about it in Acts that it was God's, God's will for, for this to be allowed to happen. And so 
in that act, our sins were forgiven, of course. Christ was resurrected and ascended, and we have eternal life because of this. But again, something that seems so out of place, something that seems so not right, yet God in his sovereignty allowed these things, directed these things to happen for the greater good, for something ultimately beautiful when seen through the lens of eternity. One more quote, I love them, and this is so true, and this, this really impacts my life, and it's, it's true in my life, and I hold on to this. I hold on to this truth that, that God is sovereign and it gives me peace. So Charles Spurgeon said this, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. Listen, because God is sovereign, even though we don't understand it, but because God is sovereign, we can trust in him, right? We may not understand uh, his hand and what he's doing, but we can trust his heart. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna jump into the text today. God, thank you for um, your sovereignty. God, thank you for the promise of eternity. Lord, just superintend this time together as we just talk, we just converse uh, about your sovereignty and how this can give us peace. Uh, Lord Jesus, how we can experience your grace through it. So superintend this time, God, we ask it. Amen. So this, the core scripture verse, you're probably familiar with it, but let me read it. It's Romans 8, chapter 28 through 30. It says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Now remember, these verses uh, come on the tail end of everything we talked about last week, about the promise of eternity and all of these things. And so there is a little section about the Spirit, and we're gonna talk about that next week. But in verse 28, he kind of picks, he picks back up that argument and says, listen, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of, of those who love him, because we do know that there are bad things in this world. Now, as we look at this and we begin to unpack this text, um, it says here in the NIV translation that uh, we know that in all things, God works for the good. I love that interpretation or that translation of the original text. So for example, Romans 8.28 in the Holman Christian Standard Bible reads, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God those who are called according to his purpose. Now, when you read that, nothing jumps off the page at you uh, really in that. But if you look at it more closely, from the Holman Christian Standard Version, you think that it's things that are working and not God. So I appreciate the NIV that they have God as the working agent. Again, let me point it out. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, okay? Compare that to the Holman Christian Standard, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Okay, so in my opinion, listen, things don't work for the good of any things because things really don't have a motive in their work. They're things, right? And even if you believed in karma, which I don't, well, karma doesn't work all things for the good because, you know, if you do something bad, then karma is going to send something bad your way. And so I really feel like the NIV does a great job here of giving credit to God and his sovereignty and acknowledging that it is God who works things out for the good, even if it's bad things, right? Because it's all things, it's God who works for the good. Philippians 2.13 talks about it. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so I really like the NIV's translation here that it's God, that it's God's sovereignty, that it's him that works all things out for the good for those who love him, and not some kind of weird, mysterious way in which things just happen to work. It's also really great here that um, when we're looking at the text this way, um, we understand that all things aren't good, but yet God works good out, even in the midst of different kinds of things. When I think about this situation, I, I can't help but go to the life of Joseph. Joseph was a young man, and, and I believe God was going to use him. But as you look at the life of Joseph, from a very young age, bad things began to happen to him. For example, if you'll remember in the story, his brothers literally were going to kill him, and then they ended up selling him 
into slavery. And so he was made into a slave and uh, so to, to traders and made into a slave. He was a slave in Potiphar's house in Egypt. And if that wasn't bad enough, he went from being sold by his brother, becoming a slave, but then he was also uh, wrongly accused of, of rape or attempted rape. And so then he was thrown in prison. Horrible situations. And, and I just, I wonder, um, in some of those moments, would Joseph be saying, oh, this is God doing stuff I don't understand, but working it out to the good? Because in that same story, numerous times, numerous times when he was in prison, when he was a slave in Potiphar's house, the text would say that God was with him. God was doing something. Now, do I think God made his brother sell him into slave, uh, slavery or to, that God made him a slave or God threw him in prison? No, no, that was part of God's permissive will, part of his permission. But yet God was working in all those things to bring out something good. And the text tells us that God was with him. This great I am was with him. Well, what would eventually happen is he would uh, interpret some dreams. He would be uh, brought into the king's council. Um, he would be made second in charge. And through a great famine, I won't go into all the story, but through his interpretations and his wisdom, uh, there was a famine in the land, and Joseph saved so many lives. In fact, he even said to his brothers later on when they needed to come to him uh, to be fed because they were going to starve if they didn't, he was able to tell them, listen, um, what you meant for good, you know, God took and worked something beautiful out of it. And through that, through God making me or allowing me to go through all of these things, God allowed me to save many people as we were able to store up all of this grain and different things. So you can see in the life of Joseph, horrible things happening, sold by his brother, into slavery, into prison. Yet God worked through all of those negative things to bring out an incredibly positive thing and many, many lives were saved. That happened because God was sovereign. Even in the midst of horrible things, God was sovereign. Jerry Bridges, uh, in a book called Trusting God Even When Life Hurts, says this, that which should distinguish the suffering of believers from unbelievers is the confidence that our suffering is under the control of an all-powerful and all-loving God. Our suffering has meaning and purpose in God's eternal plan. And he brings or allows to come into our lives only that which is for his glory and our good. And clearly we see it in the life of Joseph. And I believe in our own lives, even if we can't see it at the time, God is working to bring good to us, to others, and ultimately for his glory. Even if it's for an eternal perspective, but often we experience and we can see as we look back into our life how God actually used some of these negative situations for our good. Now in the text it also says here, and it's a little bit of a qualifier, a little bit of a conditional statement, that God is working, um, working out all things for the good for those who love him, for those who love him. Now let me, let me say this too. God is sovereign and he can work all things out uh, for the good no matter what. But when we look at this promise um, let us not run out there and do evil things or wrong things or even dumb things and just claim this promise to say, well, God's going to work it out for the good. Um, let's don't mock God or test God in that way, um, but let's truly love God and try to serve him. And then we can claim this promise that's found here in Romans 8, 29 through 30 that, listen, I love God. I'm living for God. I'm trying to do the right thing. I can trust that even though I'm going through a hard time, that he's going to sovereignly work things out for the good. Now, it says, for those who love God. Now, listen, if you were sitting right here in front of me, I can't look at you and just know whether or not you love God. But Scripture kind of lets us in on some ways that we can kind of see if people are loving God, right? So John 14, 15 says this, and this is Jesus speaking, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So we can talk with an individual and get to know them and see, are they obeying God's word? Another way we can see uh, if a person is loving God is if they're loving one another. In John 13, 35, by this all men, we know that you're my disciples, that we have this relationship, that I'm your God, that you can trust me if you love one another, if you're caring for one another. Again, in Romans 13, 10, 
Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you look at all of these proactive responses and inactive responses to God here, um, right, proactive meaning you loving and caring for others and doing God's word, and inactive responses of love if you're not doing harm to your neighbors. If we're looking at all these things and listen, and, and tough things happen in life, and it will, then we can trust that, listen, you can look to these verses and say, God, I trust you. I love you. I'm living for you. I'm caring for others. I trust that even though I'm going through a hard time right now, I trust that you're going to be able to work out and work through all of these things for your glory and my good because you are a sovereign God. As we continue to look at these verses, it says, uh, who have been called according to his purpose for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Man, this is some incredibly deep theology here, but let's look at it. So he's saying God's going to work all this out for the good, um, for those who love him. And then he says, who have been called according to his purpose. And what purpose is that? So that they would be conformed to the likeness of his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many. God's going to work all these things out to good because he knows that there's going to be something worked out in us. Isn't that awesome? God, God's going to uh, not uh, waste any opportunity to make us more like his son because that's going to bring glory to the Father. It's going to be good for us. It's going to be good for others because as we'll see, through us, God is going to work to make others uh, uh, or allow others to come and be conformed to Christ and to know him as well. So let's kind of unpack that. So it says here that the purpose is to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Uh, in this likeness, there's this image, there's this um, reality that is we're becoming more like Jesus. In the Greek there, the, that word is icon, right? It's where we get the idea of, a, or, or maybe you've even heard the old icon cameras, right? This idea of a picture. In Mark 12, 16, this is recorded. They, they brought the coin, that is to Jesus, and he asked him, whose portrait or whose icon is this? And, and whose inscription? Caesar's they replied. So here's the idea. We're to be conformed to the image, to the icon of Jesus. Now, um, we're not going to look exactly like Jesus, right, in our actions and our love and our lifestyle, but it should be close enough that other people can look at us and know, and know that we follow after Jesus. Just like Caesar's image on that coin, if you've ever seen ancient coins, right, it, it, it doesn't look exactly like Caesar. But there's enough of a likeness to know that that coin belongs to Caesar. So the same way, God is going to use all of these things. He's going to work it all out to the good because we've been called according to his purpose so that we would be conformed to the likeness, to the image of Jesus. He's going to use everything in our lives to allow us to become more like Jesus so that people can look at us and know that we follow Christ. And why is that important? Because if people see us and, and they know that we follow Christ, we're able to share with them so that they can know Christ too. Now, this is going to kind of blow your mind, but in the Old Testament, when God was talking about Adam and saying that he was created in his image, it's actually the same word that is used for idol. And an idol is a representation of something else. And what did God tell Adam to do? He said, go out into all the world. You're, you're my image. Go out into all the world, right? And, and subdue it and lead it after me, right? Show the world my glory as you're my image. And so it's pretty interesting to me that um, here is Adam, who is this image of God that's to go out into all the world and to show the glory of God to the entire creation. And God is conforming us to the image of Jesus so that we can go out to the world and show the glory of God to the entirety of creation, including our brothers and sisters. What a powerful truth. God is working in us so that we can become more like him, so that we can show him to the world, even through our suffering, even through hard things. Galatians 4, Galatians 4.19 says this, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul's hope was that Christ was be formed in us to the glory of God, to our good, and to good of others so that they can know Jesus. J.I. Packer would say in talking about the sovereignty of God and evangelism, so far from making evangelism pointless, the sovereignty of God and grace is the one thing that prevents evangelism from being pointless, for it creates the possibility, indeed the certainty, that evangelism will be fruitful. 
God using everything to make us more like him, to show himself to the world so that others would be drawn to him. What, an, what a powerful truth. What, a, what an amazing concept that God would use us even through our pain, our suffering, working all things out to the good so that we become more like Jesus Christ, so that we can reflect him to the world and others can come to him, right? So that they can know Christ and in turn bring him even more glory. What an incredible thought. John Piper um, said something very similar to this. He said, God destined us to share in Christ's glory in order that the glory of the Son might be magnified in the countless mirrors of those who are conformed to his image. Mm. And when that happens, he gets the glory because truly Christ is supreme and preeminent in all things. Boy, I could sit down on that pocket for a while, but I've got I've to keep going here. It says also here that, that God... Uh, for new, for new, or for knows all that he is called. It says in verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now listen, I, I don't want to get too heavy into theology here and talk about foreknowing and what all that means. Some people believe that God foreknew all things. He locked it in. And, and so everything happens just exactly according uh, to, to the way God wanted it to go, to how he um, thought it would go and wants it to go. Other people believe that um, God would look out into the future and he would see what mankind would ultimately do. Uh, and then he locked that into reality. And then there's still others who believe that uh, God looked out there and all these um, in his foreknowledge and all these multiple universes and he'd pick the one that would bring the, the most glory to him and, and would bring the most good to other people. So there's, there's so many ways of looking at foreknowledge and, and I, don't want to, um, I don't want to tell you how to look at it, but let me just say this. Nothing surprises God. He knew about it in advance. So let me just leave you with that idea. God foreknew what he was doing and he predestined it. He marked it out. Again, no matter how you wrestle down foreknowledge and what God foreknew, he marked it out. This word predestined, uh, it's such an interesting word. It's a, a marking out of something. It's a planning for something. It kind of reminds me of a, uh, of a baseball diamond, right? How it's marked out from home plate to first uh, base to second base to third base, all the way back to home. God foreknew his foreknowledge into the future allowed him to predestine certain things, no matter what you feel about foreknowledge. And so God predestined this path that we would walk that would make us more like Jesus. It would allow us to show God and show Jesus to the world so that more could get to know him as well. Because again, he redeems, he brings meaning to our suffering as we become more like Jesus. It goes on to also say that um, he predestined us to walk in this path, but he also called us. It's, it's no accident that you came to Jesus. I'll read it again in verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Awesome stuff. He called us. If you think about God's calling in John 6, 44, it says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws him to me and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 30, uh, 37 says this, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never draw or I'll never, never drive away. So I want you to think about this. So no matter what you think about God's foreknowledge, God predestined, he marked out a path for you and he called you. And in this text here, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God intentionally called you. He called you, he called you to walk a path. And, and knowing there's, there's gonna be things that happen in this fallen world that harm us or hurt us or that we go through, but in the midst of all of that suffering, he redeems it. He redeems it as he makes us more like Jesus. And he uses the hard stuff, even though we can't understand it, he uses the hard stuff to make us more like Jesus for our good, for the good of the world, so that we can show the world Jesus and more can come to know him, bringing him more glory and bringing the world more good. And we can believe this based on God's sovereignty and what he says in his, wor in his word. So powerful. As we look there in verse 30, it says, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, 
and those he justified, he also glorified. We've been talking about uh, God's justification and even the glorification of the body. Last week, we talked about how God one day would make all of our bodies new. Um, we talked about with justification, uh, God legally acquitting us uh, as being not guilty before him. What's powerful about verse 30 here, in God saying that we're justified, that we're innocent, that we're clean before him, and, and, and that we're going to be glorified, right? What we talked about last week, our bodies being made perfect, that eternal state happening. What's so powerful, as it says in verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. What is so powerful about all of these things is that they're all in the past tense. God has foreknown all of these things. He's marked out that path. He knows they're going to happen. He's going to make it happen. We can trust God because he's already seen it in his sovereignty, in his omniscience, in his all-knowingness, in his foreknowledge. He's seen it all play, play out. He knows how the story ends. And how the story ends is us being made more like Jesus and showing this Jesus to the world so that more can know him so that more, can, um, more people can see God working out the good in their life and believing that, bringing God more glory and more good to the world. What, what an incredible truth, what an incredible idea of God's sovereignty. Now listen, again, I just, I just wanna say sometimes life is difficult, it's hard. We talked about it last week in this fallen world. We're gonna go through hard things. But Romans 8, 28 through 30 starts off with saying, and we know. We can trust this. We can trust God. We can know that God is working in our life to make us more like Jesus so that others can see Jesus, so that they can know him and know that hope and to bring God glory and, and good to the world. I want to share one last story here as I close. close. One of my favorite uh, preachers of yesteryear was a gentleman by the name of Evie Hill. And in a book called A Savior Worth Having, he told, about, he told the story of his life about being one of five children raised by a single mother during the Great Depression in rural Texas. And of course, uh, at this time, at this point in history, it was even, even more difficult because Evie Hill is African American. But there was a woman in the local church there who he called Mama, who was not his biological mother, who got up in front of church one day and said, my boy is gonna finish high school. What you have to understand is, um, Young people in Evie Hill's day, in his situation, they uh, usually didn't finish the 10th grade and they went to work. And they went for work for $2 a day, a hard life, a challenged life. But mama said in faith that he was gonna go to college. In fact, later, or in, so that she was gonna finish high school. And then later on, she said that my boy is gonna finish college. In fact, she would go and she would buy him a suit, a bus ticket, a couple of pairs of blue jeans, some shirts, took him to the bus station, gave him $5, sent him to college, and told him she'd be praying for him. So Evie Hill gets on the bus, goes to college, doesn't know what he's gonna do when he gets there. He gets to the college. He walks uh, into the main administration office there, gets in line. As he's there, he's got a dollar and 83 cents to his name, and uh, for which he had to spend 25 cents of that in his bus fare, so he had even less as he got to the campus. As he stood in line, the story goes that he looked at the register's uh, office and there was a sign there by the cashier that said you needed $83 to register. And he had nowhere near the money, nowhere near the money to go to school. He thought about leaving. He thought about um, just forgetting about this crazy dream that his mama had and, and this idea that God had something for him and he could never come out of this hard life or this hard situation. But he remembered the prayer of his mama that, uh, that she'd be praying for him, that she believed in a big God that could work all things out for the good, even though he found himself in difficult situations. So as he stayed in that line, not knowing what he was gonna do, and it got down to three in front of him, two in front of him, a gentleman talked, tapped him on the shoulder and, said, shoulder and said, are you Ed Hill? And he said, yes. And the gentleman looked at him and said, son, I don't, I don't know what happened, but um, I take it you didn't get our letter. We've been trying to contact you. We're giving you a four-year scholarship. It'll pay for your tuition, your room, your board, and give you $35 a month spending money. 
E.V. Hill said in that moment, he learned a great lesson, that no matter what's going on in your life, God can work the good out of it. Because what he learned about Jesus, what he learned about God, is that God, um, God can do anything. God can bring you out of any situation, and he can um, do something wonderful with your life. Evie e. Hill would go on to become a, a pastor, and he would pastor in some very difficult neighborhoods in Los Angeles. But he never forgot the lesson that God can bring beautiful, bring something beautiful out of something that started very challenging and very difficult. For he did an amazing work in Evie Hill's life. And because Evie Hill was changed and conformed to Christ in that way, he changed so many others' lives. I, I pray that when you go through hard times, you can trust in God, that he's sovereign, that he's working, that he's conforming you to the image of Christ. He's redeeming that hurt. He's giving purpose in it. And it's gonna help you share God with others so that they too can be conformed uh, to Christ and to bring him glory and to change this world for the best. God bless you.